Number three, Matthew chapter five and verse five, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I want us to be reminded that the Beatitudes uh, in this chapter, each one rise one above the other, and uh, they spring out actually from each other, all right? So there's a continual flow, and uh, this Third beatitude could not have been first because if it was first, then it would be totally out of place. Jesus was the perfect teacher, and uh, he, he he also was very he was the greatest revelator. In other words, he brought revelation, but the way he did it was so very specific, very accurate in the way he thought thought things, and and that's why you know we really. Um, admire and uh, follow his teachings so carefully because it's quite easy to follow it, his train of thoughts as he begins to get into the kingdom manifesto. Uh, there was no better teacher than Jesus himself. And, and the thing I realized, you know, even as a student, when we were students before, a teacher determines whether you love the lesson or you hate it. Uh, like I said, you know, I had a bad experience with my math teacher, although I now, I, I like maths, but at that time, at that particular time, I just gave up completely on maths. I wanted to have nothing to do with maths because my maths teacher was really a tyrant. I mean, never really tried to explain things. It just, this is the way it was taught and you didn't like it. If you didn't do well in, in a few of the lessons, you know, and then you were out, you were particularly picked upon, uh, you know, and so it, it was a bad experience. And when you have a teacher that, that gives you a bad experience, what happens is you start to despise the lesson that the teacher actually wants to teach you, and although it is a good lesson. For example, the disciples and, and the nation of Israel were now in a very bad state because they were receiving teachings from the scribes and from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, and uh, the teachings were, you know, very, uh, well, it was very binding. God had given certain laws, but they had added another 300 over laws to it. And so when it says you shall rest on the Sabbath day, they carried it to an extreme, even until today, uh, as we have mentioned before, if you have ever visited Israel, on the Sabbath day, there is a lift that is called the Sabbath lift. And you, when you get inside the lift, you don't even push a button because that's considered to be work. So the lift stops at every level that you go up if you're in the hotel in Israel, especially in the Jewish sector, if you're staying in that sector. So uh, it was very binding and, and they, were, they were not only ruled by the Roman em Empire, but now they were also bound by the teachings of the of the religious leaders. That's why it says when Jesus began to teach, they said he teaches as one having authority. And they marveled, another scripture said, at the beautiful words that proceeded out of his mouth. So they never heard these beautiful words and they never heard someone teach with authority. So now Jesus comes along and everything changes. Okay, Jesus is the perfect teacher. So now when we come to this beatitude, it's amazing to see how Jesus moves from one to the other. As we said, it's like a ladder that you are climbing. It begins with the work of grace on a person's heart, convincing them. It's more, as we said, it's an intellectual thing. Convincing them of their need, number one, for a God whom, you know, they don't even know exists, especially in our kind of society, all right? where it is baptized in atheism and uh, people believe in all kinds of gods, whatever it may be, idolatry. The, the point is, is there really a God? So the, the, the work of grace by the Holy Spirit begins to convince them, first of all, that there is a God. And secondly, that this God is who he claims to be, a God of love, a God of compassion, and, and a God who really wants to, uh, you know, who created them and wants to come into a relationship with them. Now, suddenly this person begins to become, realize that he is so empty, he knows nothing uh, about God or the realm of the kingdom. So the first thing is an intellectual convincing of an individual 
that they are beggarly, they are poor in their spirit, and they really need God, and they really need to understand things that they have never understood before. For example, the significance of life. Why am I in this world today? The meaning of life, everything else. They realize that they are so devoid, so empty of this. Okay, so now... From poverty of spirit, he goes to the next one and he talks about, see, it begins with the poverty of spirit and there is almost immediately when they realize that they, they, they really need help. The moment you say, God, I am so empty, God starts to operate. Heaven starts to uh, become, uh, become more real to us. Then the next one is, then they start to moan. They moan because of their own deficiencies. They see that they are uh, so spiritually bankrupt in that sense, you know, and they see their own sin. They moan for their own sin. God, you know, when I see you, I see myself and I repent in dust and ashes in the last lesson. We talked how Job, you know, looked and said, I see the Lord and, and my whole life. I now begin to repent with dust uh, in dust and ashes. So uh, th that's the second step. Then we come from there comes out the third beatitude. And this has to do with meekness. Now, this is uh, different than the other two. How is this different than the other two? Well, the first one, poverty of spirit, deals with a personal knowledge, uh, coming into a personal knowledge of my own emptiness of my own emptiness and of my own need for God. Uh, you know, that's, that's the first thing I'm poor in my spirit that God starts to make himself real. The second is I'm moaning for my own personal deficiencies, uh, my own personal sin. It's a personal thing. So it's a more personal thing that I'm feeling. Uh, they that moan. And so out of this moaning comes a comforting. They shall be comforted. But the third one, meekness, uh, does not deal so much with me. It deals with my relationship with people on the outside. Uh, so if I were to, be, let's say I go up into a monastery and I want, to, I want to become, you know, a holy man. I go up into a monastery or, or I go up into a cave and, and start to live there and start to meditate there. Just living in that cave or living in that monastery, staying away from people to become a holy person. I cannot say uh, that I'm a meek person because a meek person can, the, the only way meekness can be uh, manifested is when they are placed together with people. And that's where meekness is demonstrated because that's where your temperament will be tested. Uh, your temperament is not tested when you are alone, right? Okay, if you are alone, you know, then uh, you don't have to, uh, no, no, there's nobody there to rub shoulders with you or whatever it may be. And, and so you are safe. And so you can say, you know, I'm a meek person, but that's not what meekness is. Meekness has to do with getting involved with people. Now, we're going to look at Blessed are the meek. And we're going to look at what really is a meek person by using the word meek as an acronym, M-E-E-K, all right? It, so you know basically it's four points. The first one, M stands for mighty, mighty. Now, what does blessed mean? Blessed means that we are approved of God. We have God's smile. We have the applause of heaven. So it says you are approved of God. Have God's smile, the applause of heaven. If you are mighty, write that down in your notes. If you are mighty and you shall inherit the earth. All right. So the next question that we want to ask ourselves is, what is the mighty? When we say the mighty or who are the mighty? Now, these are the ones who are, uh, who have authority, they have power, and they are strong. However, they have learned to restrain that power. They have learned to restrain that authority. Now, who is stronger? The one who uh, gives in, you know, to their rage and, and becomes verbally and even physically abusive. Uh, or the one who's able to control themselves through, you know, uh, discipline, remain calm, who are assured of their own strength, wh wh who is the stronger one? Of course, we would say the second one. You can have all the authority, you can have all the power, but if it is not controlled, then you are not mighty. 
you may have the power, you may have the, the, the title, you may have all of this, but if you do not know how to bring it under control, then uh, you are a weak person. A real might lies in the control, the discipline, so that you know a person does not just uh, blast somebody else. They know how to control. It's, in other words, they, they exercise a lot of self-control. Psalm 147 gives us a little bit of a clue into this. It says that the Lord's delight or His delight is not in the strength of the horse. Does this mean that God does not like horses? No, no, no. What, what it means is this, that God is not delighted in the showing or, or the brute force of a horse. Now, a horse is a very strong animal. But if it is not broken, what we call the term broken, uh, the horse is but a wild animal. It is wild, running free, under no uh, control whatsoever. And it says God does not delight in that kind of a spirit, an independent, nobody can control me, I'm on my own, I'm a self-made man kind of thing. Uh, you know, and, and you're running wild, but you have the strength, you have the power. And God does not delight in that. But what God does delight in is when that power that you have, that authority that you have, is brought under his submission. So there was a time where the centurion sends word, a centurion who is in charge, you know, of a whole segment of an army, he sends word to Jesus because he's servant. He's a good man who cares for his servant. And so he sends word to Jesus saying, you know, please, uh, my servant is sick. Please do something to help him. Of course, Jesus says, well, that, that's really nice. I, I'd like to go to your host. But he says, tell him, you know, he's not, you know, I'm not worthy to have him come into my home. But I'm a man, listen to this one, I'm a man under authority. And if I say to one, come, he comes. When I say to another, go, he goes. So if you will speak the word, what was he saying? He says, just like I am under authority, I am under the control of a higher power. I recognize that you also, Jesus, are a person under a higher power, higher than mine. But with you, when you speak a word, it affects sicknesses. It affects uh, uh, situations where you just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus' response was, I have never seen such great faith. No, not in all Israel. Isn't that saying something? That's saying something, isn't it? So being under control, a big person is a mighty person that does not exercise their authority or does not abuse their authority or their power. You know, I'm the head of the house, so what I say goes in a family. When I say something, everybody, when I say jump, you say how high kind of thing. Uh, I've seen how people treat, I've seen even Christians, I've seen it in, in uh, restaurants, how they speak to waiters and uh, I feel so embarrassed and I think to myself I mean I'm talking about Christian leaders because that's the, the area I move with I move with a lot of Christian leaders and I've seen how they speak to waiters and how they shout and yell and, and I think my goodness just because you're paying the bill just because you you know you book the entire hotel kind of thing you've got no right to speak to people the way you do that is not a meek person. That is a weak person who uses their authority and, uh, sorry, who abuses their authority. They abuse their authority. So I like what uh, Robert Schuller says when he talks about this. Listen to what he says. He says, the weak are mighty when they turn their problems into projects, their sorrows into servants, their difficulties into, dividend, into dividends, their obstacles into opportunities, their tragedies into triumphs, and their stumbling blocks into stepping stones. They look at interruptions as interludes. They harvest fruit from their frustrations. They convert enemies into friends. They convert enemies into friends. And that's what God did when he, you know, got a hold of a person like, uh, uh, like Paul. And so he takes a Saul and makes him a Paul. 
how God takes enemies and he makes friends out of them, not, not condemns them. I, I mean, if God were to have spoken over my life when I used to make fun of Christians, especially Pentecostal Christians, I, I would have been wiped out a long time ago. But God converted me from being an enemy into a friend. What a marvelous God we have. So we're talking about one M simply means mighty, right? The second is E. E stands for emotionally stable. You are approved of God. Have God smile. Have the applause of heaven. If you are emotionally stable and you inherit the earth. All right, that's really nice. So what's what's an emotionally stable person like? Well, an emotionally person, uh, stable person is one uh, who has learned, you know, through discipline to uh, uh, hold their negative, to hold back their negative impulses. They don't give in to their negative impulses. They, they avoid and they resist any distraction, you know, and uh, so that, or, or temptations that, that would kind of excite or stimulate them. They don't give in to the now. They don't want quick resources, I mean, quick, uh, a quick fix to any of the things that they are going through um, because they realize that if they give in to the excitement, the stimulants uh, of life, then it will drain them emotionally, well, of course, spiritually, and even financially and physically. So some get weak before their time. I mean, they they die even before their time because they have been drained of all that, you know, all the strength that was supposed to be theirs. That's what a, a, a person who is not emotionally stable, that's what they would happen to them. But if they are emotionally stable, then they will avoid these things, anything that would drain, drain them, okay? And... Uh, People who are driven by, by the excitement of the day or by the stimulus of the day often get emotionally dry. They, they What we call burn out. They get stressed out. And uh, even financially, their resources deplete very quickly. So they, now both of them, both of them, like even those who are emotionally stable and those who are not, they both have their ups and downs, but the emotionally stable person does not allow the downs to distract them from fulfilling their goals. They don't quit easily. They hang in there until they are finished with whatever they have started. So a few notes, in, uh, a few help us to understand it, uh, this whole idea of being a emotionally stable person. One, they are honest and hardworking people. They are more interested in substance rather than in style. They, are, they, are, they, they want to focus on character building rather than popularity ratings. They are given into this. They, they, they want to have some solid achievements. And so they, they, it will take some time. So they work very hard. At it. They are not given, as I said, into swift or fast results. They want to see something that is built solid on solid ground. So they work very hard. They are hardworking people and they are very honest in what they are doing. Be in your notes. They stick to their objectives. In other words, when they face problems, they will work towards, you know, fulfilling or patiently work through the problems in order to find a solution to it. They will work through their difficulties. They don't give up easily. See in your notes, they are patient and persistent. When they make a promise, they fulfill it. This is something that we must all learn and understand. Um, Psalm 15, if you read through Psalm 15, he talks about the person who abides in the presence of the Lord. It begins by saying, who shall ascend into the, uh, you know, into the presence of the Lord? And who shall abide? There's a difference between an ascending experience and an abiding experience. We all have many ascending, ascending experiences, but very few have abiding experiences. In other words, we go up, we need healing, Lord, heal me. Then we get our healing, we come back down, we carry on life as it was before. We face a tragedy, we go to God, we ascend, we get something, come back down. <laughs> But to stay in the presence of the Lord, it says a few things. And one of the th requirements is, 
is that they swear to their own hurt, which means that when they make a promise, uh, they have to fulfill it. They will fulfill it, even if it means at their own personal loss, because you already made a promise. You gave your word. Now, remember, in the beginning, Jesus was called the Word. So the Word is a very important thing. Today, your people's word means nothing. Even a handshake means nothing. In years gone by, they will shake hands and seal a deal. Or when they say it's done, it's done. You are as good as your word, we often hear it say. So now, when a person is like this, they are very patient. They are very persistent. They will start something. They will do it. If they make a promise, they will keep it. D in your notes. They have durability, which means that their reputation is that they can be trusted People believe in them because they have delivered. In other, you know, in other words, you can trust this person because if they say certain things, they mean it one, and if they say they are going to do something, they're going to do it. That's what you require among people, durability. You can trust this guy because we have seen how he works. We know what he's doing. I mean, he has shown over the years that he is a person that can be trusted. Okay? He can be trusted. So, M for... Mighty, E for uh, emotionally stable. The next E is for educable. Educable. You are approved or have God smile and have the applause of heaven if you are educable and you shall inherit the earth. What does this mean? In your notes, this person is, first of all, teachable. The word educable means to be teachable. To be teachable. Uh, am I a teachable person? One who does not have the I know it all attitude. I had a couple of friends of mine, especially this guy. We would go and sit with him, you know, try to encourage him. He had a small church and, you know, we would sit down. We'd have a, you know, maybe lunch together or something a couple of times. And whenever I, I would share something with him, now this guy has got so many degrees. I mean, he's got doctorate in this, you know, master's doctorate. He's got a couple of doctorates, a few theological degrees, small little church. But uh, whenever I would, you know, sit down and talk to him, he would just look back, you know, he would sit back and then he would look at me like this. And then at the end of it, he would say, David, why don't you tell me something I don't know? <laughs> now, after a couple of Visits like that, I decided, well, I think there's nothing I can tell you that you don't already know. So, I think I better stop my visits. So, the person who is like this, you know, is unteachable. Now, if I were to tell you something and uh, you get upset because I'm trying to tell you or teach you something, how to do something well, or you try to tell me something and I become upset, you know, and then, then that becomes a bit of a problem, right? That becomes a bit of a problem. So it's not, you do not have the I know it all kind of attitude. Tell me something that I don't know kind of thing, you know, and, and that's really sad. That's really sad. All right. So anyway, the, the, this person is teachable. First of all, we've got to be teachable. Uh, I remember speaking at, at one time to a good friend of mine and uh, we were going to have a certain speaker come over uh, to our church. And this friend of mine had a pretty large church. So I said to him, hey, this guy is really good. Um, he's coming over. Would you like to have him? And the guy asked me something. He said, how big is his church? So I said, well, of course, it's definitely bigger than mine. I have about 100 over people. He's got about 300 over people. And, oh, he says 300 over people because this guy had about 500, 600 people. He says, what's the guy, what, what, what does he have to teach us? Listen, we can learn even from children. We must be teachable. Sometimes children say the most amazing things. You begin to think, you begin to think, oh, what can children teach us? Oh, listen, man. We must always understand that anyone in our life can teach us something. If we don't keep learning in life, I am still learning. I'm still learning from life. I realize, you know, there's so much more that I could learn. And, and we must be teachable through circumstances in life, through meeting with different people. 
to understanding how people begin to move and how they work. That's where compassion is built. When you become a little bit more teachable and understand what people are going through, you know, you become a bit more teachable. Talk a little bit about that in just a while. Okay, so the next thing is this person allows room for growth. They listen. They are not defensive. Like I said earlier, you know, some people, when you tell them, you know, this, this is how it's got to be done, you can see the change in their face almost immediately, like, well, you know. And, and these are the ones that go, yeah, I mean, what you're saying is like this, but, <laughs> you know, but, and, and so like, yeah, but, you know, this is the way you you are saying things, but but I think this is the way. Now, if you're, if you're not willing to allow room for growth, you will never grow. You'd always be the same thing. So there's, you know, one of the greatest definitions of, of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results. So we've got to have room for growth. We must always be saying, Lord, I want to change. Uh, I'm not on an ego trip. I will not be defensive. And, uh, you know, I, I, at one time in our church, we used to say to everybody in the congregation, everybody say, I love correction. <laughs> How many of you like correction? Oh, we don't like correction, man. We don't like correction at all. We like to correct people. We like to tell people what is right and what is wrong. Of course, all of us, well, not all of you, but a lot of people like me know exactly how the government is supposed to be run. All right, so, you know, there, there must be room for growth. These people who are meek, who are educable, they are eager to listen. They are eager to learn, uh, especially listening to older, wiser, more experienced people uh, to speak into their lives. They know that they, 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 they know what they do not know, and they are eager to listen to others to help them along the way. Because we must always understand that a little learning can be very dangerous. Uh, a little learning can be very dangerous. So we need to understand that there is so much more for us to grow. That's a meek person. Now they are also, this person is also humble. Humility. Humility. Now humility is not putting yourself down. Oh, I'm nothing. I'm a useless person. I'm dead like this. I'm like that. that that's not what, it's not self uh, 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 denigration. You know, it's not like I am such a bad person kind of thing. When it talks about humility, it's being able to say, you know, I'm sorry, I was wrong. You know, I, I really like to understand the situation or help me a little bit more. Now, when, when that is the spirit that you have, then you're considered to be a meek person. But if you don't have that one, you go, you know, that, that false humility. Oh, no, man, I cannot do anything. I'm useless. I, that, that's, not, <laughs> that's not humility. Okay. In fact, Paul writes to the church and he says that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But we need to think of ourselves highly, that we are children of the living God. Of course, now when I talk about this, I'm not talking about self-love, where you say, oh, I'm such a good person. I'm such." It's talking about you know who you are. Now, the word says this, Jesus, knowing where he had come from and where he was going, took a towel and washed the disciples' feet, knowing. He knew he was God Almighty, but, but it was more of, this is something that I'd like to do. I mean, I, the, nobody's washing the feet of the disciples, so let, let me just do it. But he knew who he was. And so we also ought to know who we are. Think about the alternative. Uh, how far does a cocky person go? <laughs> you know the answer to that one. Huh? Like my friend, like I said, I know a couple of them. Another person, you know, he's always putting down every other pastor. Uh, they are not good enough. They are not praying enough. They are not... I mean, who... who we are called to judge the fruit of people. We are not called to judge people. We're called to judge the results of their lives. So we are not, you know, sometimes uh, this judgmental spirit on, I want others to pray as much as I pray. You're measuring people by your strengths. Listen to me very carefully. Do not measure people, the weaknesses of people by your strengths. Uh, he's a Christian. How come he's... He, he does this. That's because you don't do it. But he may be struggling with an area uh, that you are not struggling with. So yours, to you, that is your strength. But to that person, that's a weakness. So they are struggling. They are battling with it. Understand each person. Okay? Last of all, kind. 
you are approved of God, have God's smile, have the applause of heaven if you are mighty, emotionally stable, educable, and kind, if you are kind. All right, a kind person. So, what is a kind person like? In your notes, a kind person is, first of all, sympathetic. They are sympathetic. They, they are, well, to, to be sympathetic means to understand uh, someone's problems from your, your own perspective. I mean, you, you, you're trying to understand them from what you feel or what you view. But to move a step further than that, we need to become a little bit more empathetic. Empathetic means to put yourself in someone else's shoes and, and understand why they feel the way they feel or why they are acting the way they are acting. It goes a little bit further than sympathy. Sympathy is, I feel so sad for you, you know, kind of thing. But kind people start off by being sympathetic. It's You, you begin to say, you know, I, I realize this is where you're coming from. I'm not in that position. And from my perspective, you are way, you know, you're so far from what, life should be like for you. And so I really feel for you. But we want to go a little bit further and understand the person a little bit more, get get a bit more involved in the person's life, then everything becomes different. So a kind person is sympathetic, moving on to em empathetic. And uh, second, a kind person is secretive. In other words, this person does not show off. When they do something that is nice or kind to someone else, they go, go hey, you know what I did uh, today? Today uh, I went and did that. <laughs> they are not show-offs, yeah, all right? I'll give you an example of this. Remember the guy and the, the blind man that Jesus healed? And uh, once he was healed, sent him to the pool of Siloam. He washed his eyes and he got healed and Jesus disappeared through the crowd. And then the people come and asked him, you know, what, what happened to you? And he goes, well, the... There was this guy who came to me and told me to wash, and then I washed, and, and, and now I am healed. And they said, who is this guy? He says, I don't know who he is. And so they keep inquiring. And in other words, when Jesus did it, he didn't stand there and say, everybody, look at me, look at me. I mean, I, look at this miracle, look at this miracle. Now I want you to see this is my what I've done. A big danger is to draw attention to yourself. So uh, a person who, a kind person, is secretive. He does not brag about the great things he has done. Whether, you know, in, in dispensing of a miracle or dispensing of finances, that's why the Bible says when you give, do not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing or left hand know what your right hand is doing. Uh, it, it's a secretive thing. In other words, don't brag about it. Don't be like the Pharisee who stands there and pours in his money and then, you know, and, and let everybody hear the clinging of the, saw, uh, the, the, the coins that are coming in. Be like the little widow who goes to one side and puts in her two mites, although it is little. Don't be like the, the, the other guy, who Pharisee, who stands on one side and he's saying, God, you know, I tithe, I do this, I do that. Be like the publican who's on the other side, bowing down before God and going, God, be merciful to be a sinner. So a kind person is secretive. A kind person finally is shaped. In other words, he becomes more and more, he's conformed a little bit more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, 29, Jesus said this, Come to me, all you that are la you know, uh, laboring, you're heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek. So a kind person, a meek person is one who's become a little bit more like Jesus, a little bit more like Jesus. He's been conformed into the image of Jesus himself. So how do they inherit the earth? Well, who is mightier, Caesar with his cavalry and his army or Jesus with the cross and his disciples? Who inherited the earth? Caesar is gone. Jesus and his disciples continue the march and they inherit the earth. They inherit the earth. They shall inherit the earth. Now, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3 talks about, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who are on the face of the earth. Moses was brought up as a prince of Egypt. What is the name of the Pharaoh at that time? 
gone in the dust. Moses revered it by three, at least three different faiths, right? Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Musa, Moses. He inherited the earth. Now, again, let me just bring this across to you. You shall inherit the earth. Our place is the earth. Mankind will inherit the earth. If you are meek, you shall inherit the earth. You shall. It is not a futuristic heaven kind of a perspective. God wants us to understand that the earth is our abode. That's why we need to love this world. It's not going to get so bad that the world has to be destroyed because God never made anything that he would destroy. Right? Anything that is good that he would eventually destroy. He started off by saying, it is very good. So God's not going to destroy a very good creation. They may go through turmoil. You can call whatever you want to have. But this world will not be destroyed by nuclear bombs. God still is in control. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's given it to mankind. I always say this. What would, where would man be? If Adam had not sinned in heaven or on earth? Answer, earth. So he's preparing us to live in this life, in this world. It's going to be a glorious world that, ha that has been reshaped eventually by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything shall blossom once again. Every pollution shall be removed. All that is evil and bad shall be removed. And we will be presented with the Garden of Eden yet again. All right? So my hope is not one day I'm going to go to heaven. My, my prayer is that God make me ready. Even if I should die and my body turns back to the dust, yet in my flesh shall I see my Redeemer, Job said. He shall stand upon the earth and I shall see him. So I trust that this lesson has been profitable to you. We pray that God will keep working on us, that we will climb up this ladder one step at a time, recognizing that we are poor in our spirit moaning because of you know things that we have uh, done or not done. And then finally, we begin to say, Lord, help me to relate to people, to be kind, to be sympathetic, uh, to be educable, uh, to be emotionally stable, to be a mighty person. Although I know who I am, wherever I may be, teach me to exercise compassion in my dealing with people. Okay, so we're going to move over to Beatitude number four in the coming week. God bless.